for inviting us to, to, to be here. My, my, my space background is not as extensive as Eric, <laughs> but uh, what I'll be doing in this part of the, the presentation is uh, give you a little bit of an understanding of uh, where private space flight has gone um, uh, through the lens of my own space career. Um, and then also talk about uh, why we're here in New Zealand, what we're doing here, and then potentially some insights of like how you can actually get involved uh, in the current like, space ecosystem that's that's happening. So, uh, oops. So I'm originally from the Philippines. Um, I I'm pretty old. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, this is a photo of Buzz Aldrin when he first did his first spacewalk during the Gemini. Uh, this was few days before I was born. So I was born during the Apollo era. Like I really loved Star Trek and, and, and Star Wars and was really passionate about um, going to space. But of course, I'm from the Philippines. There's really you know, uh, not much opportunity for, for that. Uh, that's me right there. Uh, I think I was 20. Um, this was when uh, we were going down south. It took us three days uh, lagging an eight inch telescope to go down south through ferry bus and a, a, a pig farm truck uh, to get to the, the, the end of uh, the country. But, so if, but if, I was, uh, if I was deterred at that, that point in time, I would probably not be standing here today to be talking to you. Uh, so we, it, it took me about you know, 10 hops, uh, 10 countries, um, and uh, through different ways to actually get to New Zealand. Um, so I have two citizenship, I'm, I'm Filipino and American. Um, and like 30 years after, I wouldn't have thought I would have done all of the things that I've done today uh, if I was talking to that 20 year old uh, kid, <laughs> um, kind, of, kind of like decades back. But, um, so for me, I'm more of a, even more a non-traditional. So Eric uh, has, a, has an engineering background. Uh, in, the, in the Philippines, there is no aerospace engineering, so uh, my only choice was physics. So I did take an undergrad uh, degree in physics. I later on did a master's in earth and space science. Uh, and even though I'm not really good at math and science anyway, um, I guess I managed kind of like trudge uh, through uh, that process to get to where I am. Um, so my first biggest break uh, really is uh, getting a scholarship to the International Space University. Anybody here knows about ISU at all? So this, this university is something that you should really be looking at if you want to, to, to start a career in space. Uh, ISU has been around for uh, 30 years. That's where Eric and I kind of like met. Um, and um, so uh, ISU is, well, it started in, in Boston, Massachusetts. It was oh, moved to France. It's now been around for 30 years. It has programs, like summer programs, both in the north and the summer and in the southern hemisphere, where they bring together basically uh, students and uh, young uh, scientists and engineers, artists, like uh, basically multidisciplinary to think about space. And if you really want to create a, a career in space, uh, that's sort of the jumping board um, uh, to do it. Um, and there's a five-week uh, program in Adelaide in Australia around January and February time frame. They also do it uh, in the Northern Hemisphere for like 10 weeks. So isu.net.edu uh, is, is, the, is the place to go. And, and this was founded by Peter Diamandis, Todd Holly, and, and Bob Richards because they thought that uh, essentially traditional education was not cutting it. Um, and this was like 30 years ago. Uh, so this is why it's multidisciplinary, inter, uh, intercultural, um, and international. So uh, I, I was a student. I also worked for them for a while and, and uh, basically created, uh, helped create the master's program for the, the, the program. But the thing with, with Peter as well is he wasn't just like thinking about um, essentially disrupting the, the space educational um, a kind of ecosystem, but he also thought that government space is not going to cut it for everybody to go, to go up in space. So what he was like looking at is like how how do you actually jumpstart an industry? And so this is where he created XPRIZE. Anybody here uh, know anything about XPRIZE? So XPRIZE about uh, in back in 1996, 
it started the prize for $10 million for the first company, private company, to go up in space um, and then come back and do it again in two weeks. And so at that time, only government, uh, uh, basically space agencies, have gone up in, in space and, uh, and, and also air, big aerospace companies. But because of this, uh, there was about like, 20 different teams uh, that was on, on there. And the, the, pro the, the winning team basically was a group of engineers, about 20 or 30 uh, engineers, um, with a price of about like, $20 million. If you think about that, $20 million compared to what NASA has spent like, over decades, uh, that's a pretty great uh, sort of a story to tell that the, the private space industry is, is really the, the, the thing to be focusing on if you really want uh, us to have a global uh, space industry. So Eric put this up uh, also earlier. Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, all of the private space flight development so far uh, have started around the, like, the, the, the middle of like, 1996, and, and that was the beginning of X Prize. So you'll see how all of these kind of have, have started because it was inspired um, by like, regular people um, to actually look at space. But I would argue that, made, that really the company that sort of like started um, private space flight and, and opening up that, that um, sort of like frontier it's really this sort of like uh, uh, mostly not well-known company called Space Adventures. So Space Adventures had uh, really just one goal originally back in like 1998. Um, now that you know, we, we still don't have really access to space, uh, they thought that if they sell kind of space tourism type of, of, uh, of activities, then that's something that would kind of like spur the industry. Uh, so from you know shuttle launches to big flights to cosmonaut training programs, and I was lucky that uh, Peter Yuan this uh, invited me to basically um, work for them. I was the I think employee number three, and I was uh, invited to be the program um, operations and development person. But essentially, I did the program development uh, in, in basically lean uh, entrepreneurial fashion, program development, like getting all of the logistics done, uh, doing the marketing, selling it, and then also operating it. And so sometimes I'd be the tour guide and, and also the, the van driver um, sometimes. And um, the other thing that the uh, Space Adventures did was that uh, it leveraged the, the um, you know, the, the, what they call the tax emissions to the International Space Station. So what happened was the, in the past, or even like today, uh, normally there's a rotation of six months between astronauts that go up to the ISS, and you need to kind of like uh, uh, give another um, kind of like crew to go up there and only need two. So the third seat is always free. So that's what happened was that uh, the CEO of Space Adventures uh, essentially brokered the deal with the Russians and then um, used that, that private seat to sell it to um, any private citizen. And which is why back in 2001, for the price of like $20 million, and unfortunately it's actually going up. Uh, I think it's now 85 <laughs> um, because there's a monopoly. Uh, there's been uh, this essentially people who have gone in space and have paid that much um, to go up for 10 days, because that's sort of like the amount of time uh, that you stay up in, in the ISS for the rotation and then you don't come back uh, again. So, but there are perks for uh, being uh, on a space company and, uh, uh, oops, <laughs> I guess, I don't know if this is gonna play, no. Nope. Yeah, let me try it over here. Unfortunately. And so, um, yeah, one of the perks that, that, that uh, for me is that I've actually flown uh, on the Russian bombing comet several times and also <laughs> the U.S. bombing comet several times. Um, and yeah, it is really, uh, a, you just can't explain the, the, the sensation uh, of being Superman. <laughs> 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 um, 
And so that's sort of like one ex example of, of things that uh, that Space Adventures has has done. And so just to kind of like uh, look at where we are today, which is unfortunate. Um, back in 19, in 2001, uh, it's the Soyuz that has got has sent all of those passengers up um, by paying, uh, you know, paying a couple of million dollars. But fast forward 15 years after, we are still at the monopoly of, of the, the Russians and, and the Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, it's the only one that actually is going up around, especially with more more shuttle. Um, but uh, at the same time, there are companies that are are now sort of working on this. You've heard of Virgin Galactic. I mean, they've been saying that uh, they're going to fly within a year since 2009. <laughs> so, which is, but then uh, they're saying that this year, by the end of 2018, or maybe by by the beginning of 2019, that they they will start commercial flights. Um, Blue Origin, which of course is owned by Amazon's Jeff Bezos, is, uh, I mean, he, they have uh, already done successful suborbital um, experimental flights and reusable ones. Uh, there are others that are not quite going up um, into space, but uh, they use uh, balloons essentially to have capsules uh, go up, but they can only go up to about 100. The thousand feet, which in kilometers is uh, 30 about and thirty. Half. Yeah, yeah, thirty kilometers. Um, and and so, like at the moment, the suborbital flight industry has not really moved uh, much. But as Eric is like saying, there's a lot of things that ha has happened over the last five years, um, and we're hoping uh, that that's actually going to accelerate. And. And so, like right now, when we think about all of these suborbital flights, they only think about joy rides. You know, you just basically you pop up and then you can you come down. You you look at the look at the air. But what is really the point of all this? Really, the point is is point to point, uh, which is uh, you know everybody wants to at some point in time go from one end of of, of the earth to to another uh, for less than an hour. I mean, it would be awesome to go to Europe right now <laughs> in less than an hour. It takes me always like about 35 to 40 hours <laughs> to, to, to get there. Uh, but that is really, that's where we're, we're tr what we're trying to do. Um, if you think about the beginnings of the airline industry, where in the beginning, you know, only well-skilled people who can really afford uh, to go up, to go up um, on, on these airplane uh, flights were the only ones who could. Uh, but hoping that in the future, what gets not a monopoly, but that, that there is really a commercial, um, uh, you know, race um, to uh, have different companies, then we're hoping that that, actually, that, that price actually goes down. Um, so in terms of like, space tourism, well, you, there's, Definitely companies that are working on the transportation, but then it's not really tourism if you don't have a destination to go to. Um, and so, uh, space hotels is the, the, the kind of like the notion of space hotels has been around for a while. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace um, has actually sent up you know, non unmanned uh, sort of uh, module uh, stations way back in. Like 2007, 2008, so they're called Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, most people think that it's only the ISS and, and the Chinese space station that are out there, but there, are, there has been. Uh, they're just not, uh, they're not man rated. But today, uh, as Eric mentioned a few of them earlier, there are companies uh, that are purely commercial that are working on this um, as well. I mean, uh, Nanorax, for example, is a company that has piggybacked on ISS for a very long time. They, they, uh, they normally work on small payloads, um, but now they're, they also have big sort of uh, mission, uh, a mission that they're looking at to really create their own uh, station. So after working for Space Adventures, I actually, I, I resigned because I got tired of catering to wealthy and famous individuals. 
<laughs> my real goal in life is really to get uh, regular people to go up in space. Um, and so uh, around the 2007 time frame, I basically quit and I started writing a book and, and thinking about or looking at the social history of where we've come from, where private space flight has actually been around since like, the 60s and 70s, but it's just uh, a very uh, peculiar, you know, um, they're um, unconventional people who have been, been, been like, like starting to work on, on this for a while. But uh, yeah, having uh, uh, written a book and the, one of the perks of, of doing this is being able to actually interview a lot of the people that have um, sort of uh, contributed to the history of like, how we got from where we are like today. Um, but most of them I've done sort of uh, um, by interviewing them online. But uh, there are some that are really interesting to to uh, to talk to, like Elon Musk. <laughs> um, Elon is a is a pretty geeky guy. <laughs> he um, I asked him the question of whether he he would want to go to Mars because I mean he's, he's so so dead set on creating all of these rockets to, to actually go there, but, but does he really want to go? But that way back in 2008, he said he, not yet, because he wanted to see his, his kids grow up. So, but I don't know if that's there, still the same uh, today, especially with now with the VFR, um, um, almost, um, almost functional. The other thing that I worked on um, back in 2007 uh, is that at that point, there was also a resurgence of, uh, of going back to the moon. Uh, so much so that Google um, created its own X Prize, um, where there's this Google Lunar X Prize uh, for thirty million dollars for the first company to go up, go back to the moon. So private, go back to the moon, uh, basically move, uh, land the lander, move about five hundred meters, take photos and videos, and then bring that back. Uh, uh, and it was supposed to, it's supposed to have been claimed this year. But unfortunately, there was about four different companies from um, a team from Israel, India, the two from the US. Uh, unfortunately, nobody uh, really got far enough um, to, to, to go up and launch uh, this year. But um, the, the first team that actually put their name uh, uh, in for, to be a team to, to uh, go after the prize, it's called Odyssey Moon, uh, which again, um, I was lucky enough to be part of uh, the team. I was a payload flight uh, manager for them. The peculiar thing about this is most of the time, NASA actually contracts private companies um, to either work on a, on, on, on a uh, payload or work on a, on a an equipment or, or the technology, but for for this company, it's the other way around. They actually commissioned NASA or uh, leverage an already existing lunar lander to be their lunar lander. Um, eventually, Odyssey Moon became actually Moon Express, of which Eric talked about uh, earlier. And Moon Express um, is still, even though the lunar Google X Prize is is unclaimed, uh, they are still. Um, they still have a mission to go and uh, go to the moon, and uh, they will actually hitch a ride on Rocket Lab, hopefully by the beginning of next year. So the other um, organization that uh, I did work for as well, that um, um, is uh, based at NASA Ames in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, it's called Singularity University. Anybody here know about Singularity? So here's another organization that you definitely should, should hear about. Eric talked about disruptive technologies. Um, Singularity was, was, uh, was actually founded to basically leverage all of this, those disruptive technologies to solve global grand challenge, of which space is one of them. Uh, the other ones are like energy, water, uh, environment, um, so everything, everything else uh, basically that the UN Sustainability Development Goals is, is working on. Um, the uh, the thing with Singularity as well that is peculiar is that uh, it's great at birthing space entrepreneurs and startups. 
So I, when I was hired, again, it was founded by Peter Devanis, same guy who founded ISU, same guy who founded Express. Um, uh, I, was, I worked on the first uh, program, which is essentially an incubator um, for, for startups. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, over the last five or seven years, the, potentially the, the, the companies, the space companies that you see around, that have become successful or um, are are like making sort of waves um, are all come or have some um, have either been birthed or have some connections with singularity. So Eric talked about you know planet um, planet uh, has the biggest constellation of satellites uh, today. Uh, about five what seven years ago uh, they were just creating their, their nanosats in, in, the, in the garage uh, in Cupertino. Um, there is Made in Space, which is our, our students of ours uh, as well. Um, and the thing is, not all of these are US based. So uh, Endurosat, for example, is Bulgarian. Um, one thing to note with Endurosat, it also has a, um, it also has an educational platform that you should, you should look into. Um, just Google Space Academy Bulgaria, and it has the biggest uh, sort of like repository of space videos, tutorial training videos that even the European Space Agency is using. Uh, so that's it's a it's a, a private company. Also, again, one of our students from back in 2010. Um, Logic, uh again is also another um, one of those uh, companies that. Are, are looking to image uh, the Earth and uh, the founders based in Argentina. So the, the point here is that it's no longer just Silicon Valley uh, that is working to um, kind of like democratize uh, the, the, the and, and have the opportunity to actually be part of this, this industry. Uh, it's, it's basically spreading all over the world. So Eric uh, talked about uh, this, uh, again, there's, there's a lot of things that's happening today. Uh, there's big missions that, that are opening up. There's entrepreneurs that are uh, working on some parts of the big missions. But one thing that, that uh, really um, puts this into perspective is that uh, I, it reminds me of this quote, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And so it's, it's here. Um, but it's mostly predominant in the, the usual suspects that you, that you can you know, the, the big superpowers of the world, which is why um, if you look at this, this chart, um, a lot of the things that are happening in the space industry right now um, are, they're really um, backed by the nine sort of like wealthiest nations in the world. Um, out of the, you know, the 80 or so countries that are um, that have some either activity or initiative um, in space, um, and even in the investment side, you know, this is U.S. That's um, what's being dispersed uh, at this investment for new space companies outside. So for me, this is a problem because if we really want to create, you know, a really global. Uh, space economy, then we need to bring the rest of the world um, and have and give the rest of the world that opportunity as well. So this is sort of like the premise of why Eric and I are, are, are kind of here. Um, he, he mentioned, so we're Edmund Hillary Fellows. Um, we're here for three years. Um, we, our focus really is to start or, or catalyze a space industry uh, here in New Zealand. Um, and that is, the, uh, and the premise here, or our, our moonshot really is the democratization of access to space for everybody. And we're just, we're just starting in New Zealand. Um, and so the team, again, uh, uh, as Eric mentioned, there's the two of us uh, already here. We still have one guy uh, in California um, um, who's our blockchain, and I, I will, I'll uh, explain why we have a, we have a blockchain person uh, in a little bit. Um, but we are looking at uh, essentially there's a roadmap for capacity building that we think um, uh, that can happen 
um, in any uh, potential like region or nation. Uh, and, and really, um, we're trying to go through all of these, these steps uh, ourselves. Uh, which, I mean, it starts with education, uh, of course, and, but education has also been disrupted. Um, not that you don't need a four-year degree in engineering, but uh, you, your sort of your your general engineering degree can be supplemented by other kinds of, of training um, and, and skills building that are exist today, even uh, even online. Uh, so uh, so yeah, we're we're trying to to help on the education side. We want to make sure that entrepreneurs have the tools and the, the, the training um, as well um, to make it through that, that process. And once you create startups and, and projects, um, you also need a, a basically a, a, a community that can help you uh, become successful. And that uh, includes um, as also investors and the funding mechanisms uh, to make that happen. And then our fourth sort of fun uh, step here is that once those businesses actually uh, are created either you know uh, in New Zealand or in, or in, in, in other uh, countries, then uh, we want to create a platform for those goods and services to be created. Mm -hmm. um, and as I as I mentioned, we we started in New Zealand. Um, we're trying to, to to see if this kind of the platform that we're working uh, on actually works, and then we will replicate it. We're gonna open source the platform, uh, and then we'll replicate it in the different uh, countries um, that are interested. Uh, and then also, uh, we have affiliated ecosystems around the world already that uh, are working on their own, and we wanna also kind of like link them all together. So the, the two things that are, uh, I guess, uh, I could say a little bit more unique to what we're, we're trying to do is that we, we are creating this community platform and we want to, to have this platform be trading in a token uh, economy um, at, some, at some point in time. What we want to do is essentially we want to incentivize people to collaborate, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and so what we want to do is to basically award people uh, with credits as tokens. So they become space-based tokens that you can use either as a voting mechanism for projects that we will fund uh, in the future uh, to uh, trading uh, for services and activities within, within the community, like uh, say events or, or uh, job postings and so forth. Um, and then uh, also can be exchanged for products and services in this marketplace that we're also creating, which is a separate thing uh, from Space Base, which is called Space Launch. Um, so what is this marketplace? Uh, the, what we're trying to do is we, we want to try and help uh, entrepreneurs basically find funding without uh, losing their equity. So this is not an IPO. It's, a, uh, it's essentially uh, pre-selling your services uh, 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 by, getting by basically getting utility tokens. Um, and, and by doing that, um, those who, uh, who buy tokens can also resell those tokens. Um, and then right now there is no such thing as a kind of like as a kayak of, of uh, space uh, products and services. So that's sort of the long-term goal of this, um, is that if you think of kayak today and you want to go from one, one place to another, uh, depending on what your needs are, you can either uh, you know, buy from a big airline or, or a budget airline. Uh, and so by having a marketplace that is transparent and, um, and, and also has the same kind of uh, uh, visibility for either big players and, and small players, that's sort of like how we're going to be able to bring in the rest of the world to um, be part of this, the space industry. Um, so why New Zealand? I mean, we could have gone to like you know, Luxembourg or uh, Singapore. Um, and uh, the, the thing is, so there's a few elements for, for how we think uh, a sustainable space industry can actually arise. Um, and we think that New Zealand actually takes all of those boxes. Um, for, and and you know, I've, I've outlined it here. It's essentially from having a very progressive 
uh, government that uh, works pretty fast, I mean, compared to what, what we're used to uh, in the US, um, to uh, now having also the infrastructure and the launch capability with Rocket Lab, um, then also uh, an existing 